Hey guys, welcome back. We'll continue with the book Cracking Codes with Python. And in this video, we are going to cover the Caesar cipher. We are also going to learn about for loops. Let's jump right in. We already learned some of the basics of Caesar cipher and how to use the cipher wheel. In this video, we are now finally going to implement Caesar cipher and use it to encrypt and decrypt some messages. If you want to follow along, you can head over to inventwithpython.com. You can also find the link in the description down below. Now to get started, we can open up idle and then we can head over to file, new file and create a new file for our program. We can save our program under caesarcipher.py and then we can get started writing our program. Now we need to use Piperclip, which we installed in one of the previous videos. If you haven't installed Piperclip yet, you can see how to do that in the first video of the series. Next up, we're going to define the string that we want to encrypt or decrypt using Caesar cipher. We already did this in the previous video where we learned about the reverse cipher. But in contrast to the reverse cipher, the Caesar cipher actually uses a key to decrypt a message. And that makes it harder to decrypt a message that was encrypted using the Caesar cipher. In this case, we're going to set the key variable to 13. We also need to specify whether the program should encrypt a message or decrypt a message. For that, we are going to use the mode variable that we define here. And for now, we are going to set it to encrypt. Of course, if we want to decrypt a message instead, then we would switch this to decrypt instead. Now the Caesar cipher uses a cipher wheel and shifts the used symbols by a certain number of entries, which is specified by the key. So in order to compute that, we need to specify our symbols. So here we have the alphabet in uppercase letters and lowercase letters. And we also have the numbers one through nine and also zero. And then a space character exclamation mark and question mark as well as a period. Now, just as with the reverse cipher in the last video, we also need a place to store our encrypted or decrypted message. For that, we are specifying a new variable called translated and we're going to set it to an empty string. Next up, we have something we haven't seen before, a for loop. We learned about a while loop in the last video and a while loop basically looped over a certain block of code until the Boolean condition associated with the while loop was evaluated to false. The for loop instead loops over a block of code a certain number of times. We're going to have a closer look at the for loop in just a little bit, but for now it's just important to note that we are going to loop over each symbol in our message that we specified up here. And for each of those entries here, we're going to check if that symbol, for example here, capital T, is an element inside of our symbols variable. And symbols here, as you can see, is written in all uppercase letters. And this is a specific kind of variable. In fact, it's a constant, meaning that this variable cannot be changed later on. And constants are always useful if you want to work with a certain variable that should be fixed. For example, the number pi, or in our case here, our symbols, because we don't want to make any changes to those. So we are checking if the character here is inside of our symbols string. In this case, it would be true because t is one of the entries inside of our symbols constant. And then we're going to use the find function here and we pass the specific symbol. So in this case, for example, capital T as an argument to the find function, which is called on our symbols constant. And this gives us back the index at which the specific character or symbol exists. So as an example, if we had the letter A and we were using the find function here and pass the letter A to it, then we can see that A is the first character inside of the string here, which has the index zero. So in this case, the symbol index would have a value of zero. We're then checking if we are performing an encryption or a decryption. And that depends, of course, on the modes that we specified up here. So if mode is equal to encrypt, then we would encrypt our program. Otherwise, if it's set to decrypt, then we would decrypt our program. Depending on what we have selected, we basically have to turn our cipher wheel forward or backwards. And that is basically accomplished by either adding or subtracting the key from our symbol index. So for example, if we have character A here, the symbol index, as we know by using the find function here would have a value of zero. And if we have a key of 13, if we want to encrypt a message, we would add 
the key to it. So we would go 13 positions in this case forward. If instead we were to decrypt a message, then we of course would need to move back those 13 positions. Of course, we only have a finite number of symbols here. So if for instance, we had an exclamation mark here at the end of our message, for instance, and then we have our key of 13, of course, there are no 13 positions we can go forward. And therefore we need to make sure that we go forward two positions, then we start at the beginning again, and we move forward those missing 11 positions. And to accomplish that, we need to handle this wraparound. So here we're going to say if the translated index, so in our case, for instance, maybe the exclamation mark here, which would then have the key added to it, as we can see by this calculation here, if that is greater than or equal to the length of the symbol, so if it would go outside of the bounds of the string, then we're going to take our translated index that would be outside of the bounds, and we're going to subtract the length of the symbols from it. And if instead the translated index is less than zero, then we would add the length of the symbols to it. And then by the end of it, of course, we need to update our translated string, which is currently empty when we start out, and we add, as with the reverse cipher, an additional character to it. So in this case here, we would take our translated index, that means our individual character from our original message, shifted by, in this case, 13 positions for our key, and that new entry will then be added to our translated string. And as we already learned before, we can use that bracket notation here to reference a specific index inside of our string. So a value of zero would be the first entry, a value of one would be the second entry, and so on and so forth. Now, if this statement here, so if the symbol that we're looking at is actually not inside of our symbols constant, then rather than applying the key here and shifting the position of the symbol, we're simply going to append that specific symbol to the end of our translated string. So there's basically no encryption or decryption happening to such a symbol. And since we have this for loop here that checks all the different symbols inside of our message, we would basically follow those steps for each of the individual characters inside of our original message. And then by the end of it, our message will be encrypted or decrypted depending on what mode we selected. And then at the very end, we need to output the translated string, of course. So in this case, we would print out the result of translated of that string that was empty initially, which we then constructed based on using the keys for decrypting or encrypting our message. And at the very end, we want to actually copy our translated string. So we are using our paperclip module and then we pass translated as an argument to it. Now let's run our program by going over to run and then run module. And here we can see our program runs and this is the encrypted message we get back. Now that we know that our program works properly, let's have a closer look at the details. Here at the beginning, we are importing Piperclip and Piperclip is a separate module. A module is used to add additional functions, additional capabilities to a Python program. And a module is basically just another Python file that contains additional functionality. So in this case here, we are importing Paperclip so that here at the bottom of our program, we can call the copy function, which is part of the Paperclip module and defined in the Paperclip module. Let's next have a look at our for loop. So for loop has this structure. We have the for keyword, first of all, then we have a variable name that will be referenced within the block of the for loop typically. Then we have the in keyword, and then we have a string or variable that contains a string. After that, we have a colon, and then we have a block of codes uh, that is indented. And in comparison to a while loop, a for loop has a specific number of times the loop will be run. While in a while loop, we always check a certain condition if it's true or false. A for loop will iterate, for example, over all the entries in a string and then stop execution. Inside of our for loop, we also have an if statement. An if statement always checks a condition and the condition which evaluates to a Boolean value, either true or false, will then evaluate to whether the if statement is executed or not. So if this condition here is true, then the block of code underneath the if statement will be executed. And if this if statement is evaluating to false, then we are going to execute the else statement. We can also cover multiple different conditions. So in this case, we would use an elif statement. So here we are checking if the mode is set to encrypt, then we're going to execute this block of code. 
Otherwise, if the mode is set to decrypt, then we are going to execute this type of code here. And of course, we could have multiple ELIF statements and at the end also an ELSE statement to cover all other cases. Now let's have a look at the practice questions. The first one is that we should use our program to encrypt the following sentences with the given keys. So here we have a string, which is our message, and then we're gonna have key eight. So let's switch over to our Caesar cipher program and we can replace this message we have been working with so far with the new message that we have. We also need to update the key. It's currently set to 13. So if you want to change it to eight, we're going to save this and then we can run our program again. So this is the encrypted output we would get by running that message with key eight. Next up, we should run the string of digits with a key of 21. Again, we're going to update the message here. So this is going to contain these digits and we're going to update the key and set it to 21. Let's run our program again. And this is the encrypted output we would get. Next up, we should use our program to decrypt some messages with a given key. So this is the first one here. And we're going to use a key of two. So back in our program, we're going to update our message string. We're going to set the key to two. And of course, we need to make sure that we switch the mode from encrypt to decrypt because we want to decrypt the message which is currently encrypted. So with that in place, let's run our program again. And this is a decrypted message. So this evaluates to, it sounds plausible enough. Next up, we should take this string here with a key of 22. So let's update our string here. Let's update the key as well. The mode is already set to decrypt and then we can run our module again. And again, this is our decrypted message. Now the next question is which Python instruction would import a module named watermelon.py? So we now we need to use the import statement. In fact, if we switch over to our program, we can see here we are importing the paperclip module. So if we had a separate module called watermelon.py, then we would go ahead and type in import, followed by watermelon. And then of course, if this module contains any functions, for instance, that we want to use, we would reference it by typing watermelon and then the name of the function. So I'm just going to call it example, for instance. And if this is a function defined inside of the watermelon module, then we would be able to use it this way. Next up, we have a couple of different code sections that we should evaluate. So what do the following pieces of code display on the screen? In the first case here, we have a variable spam that is set to the string foo. And then we iterate over each entry inside of spam. So each character inside of the string. And then we are updating our string by adding that specific character to the end of it. So basically we would start out by taking the first character here, F, adding it to the end, then continuing with the O and the second O. So by the end we would have foo foo, and this is what should be printed out by the end. Let's try running this in our interactive shell in idle. So we specify our variable, we have our for loop, and then we are going to print out spam, and here indeed we see foo foo. So we basically duplicated the string and repeated the default string again. Next up, we have an if elif else statement. So here we're checking if 10 is less than five, we would print hello. And then we have a number of elif condition and at the end an else statement. So we need to start out by evaluating the first Boolean condition here. Is 10 less than five? That of course evaluates to false. So this print statement won't be executed. We need to check the second case. So elif false. In this case, the question is, if the Boolean expression false evaluates to false or true, this evaluates to false and therefore this won't be executed either. Next up, we're checking if five is not equal to five. That of course also evaluates to false, so this won't be executed. And then we have the default clause here else, so we're going to print out goodbye. So let's verify that in the interactive shell. Here we have our if elif else statement. Let's execute that and indeed we see that goodbye is printed out so the else clause is executed. Next up we have a print statement here and here we have the string f which consists of a single character not in foo. So not and in are keywords that evaluate whether that particular string f is contained in the string foo. And this expression will be evaluated to either true or false based on the Boolean condition. So 
is f not in foo? We know that f, the character, is inside of foo, it's indeed the first character. So therefore this statement should evaluate to false. So therefore false should be printed out. Let's verify that in our interactive shell. And as we press enter, we can indeed see that we see false displayed here. Next up, we have a print statement. And here again, we have an in keyword. So is foo in f? That should evaluate to false as well. We know that f is in foo, but foo is not in f because it's a single character. So let's hop into our interactive shell and let's run that. And we would expect that to be a false message displayed, which is indeed the case. And finally, we have a print statement here. We are using the find function this time. And inside of our string hello, we are searching for OO. And that is something that we won't be able to find. We have, of course, an O in here at the very end, but we don't have a sequence of two O's one after another. And we know that the find function always returns the index where the first occurrence of the string we're looking for can actually be found. But if it's never found, then we will get back a result of minus one, which indicates that the string we're adding to the find function here as an argument was actually not found inside of the string we are searching in. So let's verify that inside of our interactive shell. And of course we would expect to get back minus one because we cannot find OO inside of the hello string. And this is indeed what we get back. We learned how to implement the Caesar cipher and we also learned some additional programming concepts. In the next video, we're going to cover how we can hack the Caesar cipher. Subscribe to the channel to stay up to date and see you guys in the next video.